The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. This webinar will begin shortly. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today we are joined by Jerry Owen. She will present, How Did I Miss That Bug? Overcome Cognitive Bias in Testing. We also have two other webinars on our Huddle site at the moment for, that you can register for. One is Developing quality, a Quality Engineering Workforce and the other is Laying the Foundation for Enduring Success, Elements of a UI Automation Framework. Those two webinars are over on our Huddle site and you can register for them now. If you have any questions for Jerry at any time during this webinar, please do leave your, an, your questions even in the questions box on the right hand side of your screen and we'll do a Q&A at the very end. So without further ado, I will hand over to Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Hello. Perfect. Good morning, Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, We'll be talking about one of my favorite topics today, which is cognitive bias and testing and how we apply that to bugs, specifically missing bugs. So I'm Jerry Owen. I'm QA evangelist at Qualitest Group. I do a lot of speaking and writing on test topics. I'm a very experienced tester and um, test lead. Um, and there's my contact information. Welcome any of your comments afterwards if you'd like to get in touch with me. So our agenda today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about why, why are we talking about missing bugs anyway. We'll talk about what a missed bug is, how we miss bugs, and then we'll get into how we think and how and biases and how that applies to missing bugs. And finally, how to manage our biases in testing. So why are we talking about missed bugs? Well, have you as a tester ever missed a bug? Have you been asked how you missed that bug? Maybe you may have wondered how you missed that bug. Well, there are a lot of consequences for missing bugs. I mean, it can be anything from negative publicity, even as far as, as, as caught of loss of life. We recently heard about um, a lady that was run down and killed by a self-driving car. It, miss bugs in whatever nature they are cause mayhem. You know, in, in most organizations, anytime any kind of a bug crawls into production, mayhem of magnanimous proportions ensues. And sometimes the focus of finding out 
why it happened takes priority over the fix. And in the name of continuous improvement, we would begin the root cause analysis. And some, in some organizations, that's an effective process. In others, it tends to just assign blame. So I worked in an organization once that, that was really using the root cause analysis to assign blame. Our as test lead, we had to determine whether it was the root cause was code requirements, missed test case, missed regression, negative positive tests, whatever. Um, and metrics were developed to track this. So our test leads were dreading root cause analysis and our testers were working in fear of missing bugs. So I really, as a test lead in this environment, I wanted to help testers and test leads reduce the bug misses. So I started to think a bit about how we miss bugs. And when I really thought about it, I came to the conclusion that the how is much more important than the why. I mean, the why is the root cause analysis, but we want to find out how we did that. How did we miss that bug? And now I invite you to join me in my journey of discovering how we miss bugs. So some of the whys, missed test cases, misunderstandings of requirements, inattention, fatigue, burnout, multitasking. But have we ever thought it could have something to do with how we test? We need to kind of step back and, and look at how we test. So what is software testing? Well, it's, it's basically, it's making judgments about the quality of the software under test. And that involves objective comparisons of code to specifications. We do that with our test cases. But it also involves subjective assessments, especially when it comes to usability and functionality. And so what is a missed bug then? It's basically an error in judgment. Has anybody ever thought of it that way? So, the more I thought about that, to determine how testers miss bugs, we need to understand how humans make judgments, especially in complex situations like testing. So we need to take a look then at how we think. So how do we think? How do we, do we make judgments? This is something that, um, Daniel Kahneman and, and Dan O'Reilly and, and a bunch of social scientists have taken a look at. There's a couple of ways. You know, Daniel Kahneman put together a framework um, of models of thinking. He, he wrote this in a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. He defined two different models. System one thinking, which is fast and intuitive, yet sometimes wrong. And system two thinking, which is slower, more deliberate, and more accurate. So we use both of these types of thinkings in our daily life as well as in our practice of testing. Um, system one tends to keep us functioning. It's fast decisions, but it can be gullible and biased. It can, we can make mistakes. Um, it, it, system one thinking tends to use um, heuristics or rules of thumb. System two makes more deliberate, thoughtful decisions it can be difficult to engage and, it, and, it, and you tire easily when you're using a lot of system two thinking. You might find that after a long day of executing test cases, that you're really tired. So we apply these types of thinking in, in a couple of different ways. Your system one thinking is usually our, our initial reactions. Our system two thinking is applied when we analyze problems. Um, executing test cases. And now sometimes the way we see something initially and the way we analyze it, there can be conflict. And when the system one and system two are in conflict, that leads to biases in decision-making. And those biases can impact how we test. So the way they impact testing is that um, we do maintain beliefs in our testing practice. They may not be true, but they can affect our test results. And sometimes we can be predisposed to believe something that may affect our conclusions and our work in testing. We may judge the wrong, we may test the wrong things. 
we may not find the errors, we may find false errors. You know, we've, we've always had, we always sometimes, how often have you written up a bug and it turns out to be as designed? That can sometimes, that can be cause for bias. So let's see if you have biases. Try to read this. Now, if you're reading, if you're able to read this, your, your mind is actually making the corrections as it goes along. So it's not, it's not necessarily seeing all the errors. And, and this happens often when we test. That's how we miss bugs. We don't see, we don't see these errors. They're an, an, an uh, error in our judgment. So we're gonna talk about some of these biases. That, and that there's over 100 um, biases that, that social scientists have identified. But there are a few that tend to be um, most frequently impacting our testing. So I want to talk a little bit about those. First is the representative bias. Uh, this happens when we judge the likelihood of an occurrence in a situation by how closely it resembles other situations. Um, we can be influenced this designing our data matrix. Maybe we don't test all the data in, in all the states. We may not test with enough types of data. Um, I had a bug once with one of, one of my teams. Um, one of the things that we needed to test was the print function. So we printed once. Well, we didn't think to try to print the same thing again. And we missed that bug. We just judged that because it printed once, it would print every time. That was our representative bias at work. Uh, there's the curse of knowledge. Now, the curse of knowledge happens when we're so knowledgeable about something that we don't address it from a more uninformed or a more neutral perspective. Uh, this happens a lot in, um, in testing, especially when we're testing the same application. You know, we, and, and it, it's a good thing as, for testers to become domain experts, to become experts in their respective applications. But the problem with that is that you may miss bugs that somebody that is unfamiliar with the application would, would find, and uh, particularly usability. I mean, just because we know how a workflow works doesn't mean that somebody who's never used the application is, is going to to understand that. Um, I had a, this was actually one of my favorite bugs. Um, I was testing an application uh, for an annuity. Now, this product, this application um, was a website and the insurance agents would go to meet with their clients and they would enter the application for the annuity as they talked to their clients. So this one, we added this one product to the website, which was called a decedent IRA, which meant that it was for married couples. And when one passed, the other could, could continue the IRA rather than, than cashing it in. So, but the, the, the uh, this transaction of continuing it had to take place within six months of the date of death. So they go to fill out the whole new application. Well, the date of death is about eight screens into the application. Well, why would a, an agent be wanting to sit with his client, type in eight screens, and then find out that they couldn't do the transaction at all? So I submit, I mean, that certainly is a usability bug. Um, it came back as as, as designed. Um, what the developers tried to say was that the um, the uh, specification didn't say exactly what screen it should have been put on, and eventually it did get fixed. But you can see a lot of bias in the, you. You can see the curse of knowledge in there. Um, not only as I could have missed that but probably the BSA who defined the requirements just assumed that they would put it in the front. Um, so there's bias not only on the tester's point, but also on the, the developer on the BSA. 
another one of uh, biases that tends to affect us a lot in testing is the congruence bias. And that is the tendency of experimenters to plan and execute tests based on their own hypotheses without considering alternative hypotheses. Basically, you know, we are as testers, we are experimenters. Um, often this bias is, cause, is the cause of a lot of missed, missed negative test cases. Uh, you know, you, you, you write all your, your test cases to validate that the functionality works according to spec, but sometimes you may not validate that it doesn't do something that it shouldn't do. Um, and I think, you know, I think probably all of you can, can think of a time that you missed a negative test case. The confirmation bias is the tendency to search for and interpret information in a way that confirms your initial perceptions. And so there again, you know, if you think, you're testing to specification, so your initial perception is probably what the specification said. But you know, we can also look at we we have we have our perceptions of the quality of the code, the quality of requirements, and even the capability of our teammates. So you know, sometimes uh, I know years ago I, I was work I used to work with a team of developers, and there was one that I always knew there'd always be a lot of bugs. So we, anything we knew that this particular developer wrote, we test it and test it and test it. But what we were doing was we can miss bugs of people that, the developers that, that usually wrote really good code, just because we were, we were trying to confirm our perception on this one developer. So the anchoring effect is, is an interesting perception. Um, this this one this one is a is is a tendency to be to become locked on and rely too heavily on one piece of information. Now, often um, you'll you'll see anchoring comes in in like you'll see something on sale only twelve ninety nine. So it makes you think you know that that you don't think about it being that twelve ninety nine might be expensive for that particular item. Um, this one affects us in testing because sometimes we'll, we'll validate the code specifically, but we won't consider other ambiguities that, that especially when we're looking at requirements, we may, not, we may not find all the ambiguities that we should. Um, this is a little something that I'd just like to test you with. Um, basically, oh, oh, back. Basically, I want you to just count the number of times the white team is passing. Okay. So the correct answer is 15, but did you see anything else? There was a gorilla that walked through, see? Now, usually 50% um, of people, this was an experiment done by Shabri and Simon of Harvard University. Um, they, um, they found that when they gave this test to people, um, half of them, literally half of them, missed the gorilla. And how they missed the gorilla? Well, that has to do with probably one of my favorite biases, which is something called inattentional blindness. Basically, it's, it's focusing so much on one thing that you're blind to other things, even big things. Sometimes um, that can come from a lack of attention. Uh, it can come from, I think in, in, in testing, it, it can come from focusing so much on our test cases that we, we don't look around, we don't do enough exploratory testing. Um, and, and, you know, I had one team of people 
talk to me about, you know, I, I, anytime um, I get to conferences and whatnot, I love to ask people about their favorite bugs. And I'd love if you guys want to put your favorite bugs in, into the chat. Um, you know, that one of the best bugs that I think was, was a great example of inattentional blindness is the, um, somebody actually told me, and, and I've heard it twice now, um, two, by two different people, they, they were testing websites and they missed that the name of the organization was spelled wrong. Well, if you didn't have a test case for that, that's probably why. So how do we develop these biases? Well, that's actually a bias. You know, West Meserve and Stanovich um, did some research and, and found that um, that we evaluate our own decision-making processes differently than we evaluate other people. Basically, we don't think we're biased. We, we, can, we can see biases in, in other people and our colleagues, but we don't recognize our own bias. We, we perceive ourselves differently than other people. So let's relate this to finding bugs. Well, how do we apply this to, manage, to missing bugs? Well, we need to manage the way we think throughout the test process. This means we need to manage it as individual testers, as test managers, and even, even as a professional community. So let's go back to figuring out now how testers can manage their thought processes. And if we think back to Kahneman and Traversky's system one and system two thinking, which do you think we need to use more of? Think about that for a minute. Well, system two thinking, um, our test methodology is the analytical framework. So that obviously involves system two thinking. It does place us under a lot of cognitive load. You know, we can think about how tired we are after a day of testing or even a day of developing test cases. Um, and basically, we are using our system to thinking to determine whether our actual results match expected results, right? So that, in, in fact, is an objective assessment, which is what system two thinking is about. Now, how would we find more bugs? Um, some people would say we need to focus more on system two, but I think we need to focus more on, on system one, on intuition and emotion, because that's where, that's where we, we get into our exploratory testing. Um, you know, how do we, when we validate that the, we validate according to specifications, we write our test cases, we have, we have appropriate test coverage, but does that mean the application is bug free? I don't think 100, I think you'll all probably agree that 100% test coverage with all the test cases passed doesn't mean that the application is exactly what the customer intended. I mean, how often do you, you get reports back from, from, from the uh, help desk with the users are doing things that nobody ever would have considered? So, the question becomes then is how do we find the bugs that present the application from working exactly as the customer intended? Well, I think this means this is what comes down to system one thinking. We need to focus a little bit more on intuition and emotion. Now, how do we do that? Well, we can use, we use heuristics with oracles. Um, you know, the John Bach and Michael Bolton the uh, context and the whole context-driven school, that's what they're about. They want us to use more, they want us to use more system one. We can, we can use it, we can even use our emotions to indicate potential bugs. How many of you have been like sitting there tapping the, you know, sitting there tapping your fingers on the waiting, 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 and getting nervous and, and but that, you know, if, if you're waiting like that, that could, that could indicate a performance issue. You know, it could it could indicate something that that needs to that you're you're you're, and if you're always wondering if the system is going to come up, but when is it going to crash? That could indicate a reliability issue. 
Uh, and I think the other thing that that's really kind of the basis that, of testing using system one is exploratory testing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. So I'm sure probably many of you have done some exploratory testing, but basically, what is it? It's, it's simultaneously learning, test design and testing, and test execution. Um, there are lots of tools that we can use to record the session, which is, is really a great, um, a great approach because then you can go back that that makes sure that makes the bugs you find repeatable. You can go back and, and use the steps that your tool collected to repeat it. Um, some of the characteristics are, though, that, that it's planned. You know, we don't just usually just jump in and say, oh, test. Of course, we can do that. It's not necessarily a bad idea, but we usually time box it. It's a discovery process, and of course, it's different for every application. Um, there's a couple of ways of doing it. We can do um, unstructured exploratory testing, and, and when we do that, um, it minimizes preconceived notions about the application, and it also helps to alleviate the curse of knowledge because we don't get to know it first. Um, we can use an oracle here. What, what might be an oracle? Well, maybe how the data flows through the system. Our, our users' perspectives can be an oracle. Uh, structured. We can use a structured type of exploratory test casing. We'd want testing. We would want to do this earlier as the modules are developed. This is great for, I think, especially great for Agile and DevOps um, because we have to limit our test cases there. These are time box sessions. Sometimes they'll even involve multiple sessions and, and testers, and we'll do a post review session afterwards. And that's a great time to compare with your colleagues and kind of minimize each other's biases. Um, usually we'll find, we'll take a look at the tasks that are performed by the user, things they might do. Those are the things you would probably want to cover in your charter. You definitely want to document it. It's not really going to be ad hoc testing, but deviate from the plan whenever you need to. That's, that's what intuition is about. You would use intuition to say, well, this is a different path that we do need to go down. Um, and you want to look at it as what can you learn? What can you learn about the software? How is, and, and think about how the user wants it to work. And it'll show the strengths and weaknesses of the application. It's great for usability. And we can discover, we can discover situations of interest. They can be the usual tasks, but they can also be things that a user might do. And if it doesn't behave as expected, just keep exploring. Now, how often have you recorded a bug and, and the, the developer will say, well, a user would never do that. Well, a great response to that is, well, tell me what else a user would never do and I'll try that too. So then let's look at a little bit about what, what can a test manager do? Well, as a test manager, we really need to focus on allowing testers to feel comfortable and empowered. We want them to use their system one, we want to empower testers to use their system one thinking. How often we're, we're always, we're always seem to be, you know, trying to get things done as quickly as possible. Well, I, I think, um, and, and some of that, of course, comes from the anchoring bias, but the anchoring bias as, as described by our business. Um, Andrew Brown uh, talked about this at Star West recently about how um, various biases can impact the estimation process. And um, he mentioned that, you know, when the business comes up with a, a a request for a new feature or, or, or whatever, well, when do they want it? They'll say, as soon as possible. So they're anchoring, they're anchoring the team to come up with a short estimate, an estimate that, you know, probably isn't allowing enough time to, to do adequate coding and testing. And this is where the test managers come in. Test managers need to need to really watch how they, how they uh, make their estimates, make sure they allow time for the testers to, to, to use their system one thinking. They need to plan time in the test schedule for exploratory tests. They need to encourage testers to take risks. 
you know, it's 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 okay to to find a bug that's not a bug. People need you need to encourage test testers to to do that to to try different things to try things they might not necessarily try, and then they want a reward for the quality of the bugs rather than the quantity of the test case executed, and and we don't want to count but count miss bugs against our testers. That that's that is so critical because if testers are afraid of missing bugs then they will stick to just the plan and will be afraid to try other things to, to find those bugs that they may not actually have found that, that may not come out of the test cases. So what can we do as a QA profession? Well, I, I, think, I think it really, really needs to involve a paradigm shift. And, and it doesn't matter what methodology, whether you're using waterfall, agile, DevOps, we still have to, to sh shift from the requirements coverage to a more intuitive approach. And I think that becomes even more important in, 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 in DevOps and, and when we get to continuous testing, um, because we need to optimize our testing. It, it, that's that's really the critical thing in, in Agile and DevOps. Uh, test optimization it means we need to to get the, the best, the biggest bang for the buck out of each test case. We need to have the fewest number of test cases that that give us the greatest amount of coverage. And that that can be challenging. You know, I mean, we've gone from in Waterfall, we we create these huge automation suites, and oh, we covered everything. They're 100% effective, but they were not efficient. When we got when we got into agile and we get into our two week our our deployments every you know our our deployments every sprint, we need to get a test. We needed to get a, a test week that would run overnight, and we thought that was great. And then we get to continuous testing. Well, a test week that runs overnight is now a bottleneck. So we had to get that even shorter. We have to optimize. So we're using only the most important tests, the more targeted tests, the risk-based tests. And so we're, we're taking more and more risk, but how do we mitigate that risk? We need to mitigate that risk by using more exploratory testing. The business testing needs to become the norm rather than the business flow testing needs to be the norm rather than the exception. These, the, this actually, using system one thinking, it is really more of, of a, a, a risk mitigation strategy. And our purpose really needs to be about providing information versus finding bugs. Because it, 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 again, we go back to making judgments. You know, we want to provide information about the fitness of the code to go to production. And it's a judgment. And when bugs show up in production, again, it's, it's, it's just an error in judgment. So we need to, we should always question our test results. You know, have you, do you ever get a nagging feeling you, you, you look at your you look at your automation suite. You look at you look at all the all the results through the automation suite, and looks like everything's passed. But there's this nagging, nagging feeling. Well, you got to listen to that nagging feeling because usually, when you have a nagging feeling, there's something wrong. I, I had a, I had a situation with that. And it, it, it totally turned out, I said, you know, we're, we're, we've got something wrong here. It's, it's just, and we kind of figured out that, that we actually had maybe the whole strategy wrong. And we fixed it before we got to production. Um, you know, we can fall in love with our test results, especially it, we've put a lot of effort into writing our test cases. Um, and, and we think everything's perfect, but maybe it isn't. You know, what, what, about, what about differences of opinion among the team? We have to really pay attention to those differences of opinion. We need to, to listen to everybody's opinion and respect and, and honor everybody's opinion because 
somebody that's 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 playing the devil's advocate really might have something and we need to look we need to look to that we need to 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 consider what our developers are thinking and and you know it, it doesn't hurt to it doesn't hurt to ask the developers you know okay so i'm going to retest this bug um what other areas of the code might be impacted you know you might be surprised i was surprised once i was i was testing a bug and the developer said well you also ought to check this this and that and i'm like really sure enough when i did there were more bugs so you know it, it certainly you seek out the opinions of of your of your developers another great place to to look for um to look for help with testing and help with getting you know getting some ideas getting getting some ideas of what you should test especially to get to know the user would be your your help desk um they talk to they're helping the users they talk to the users every day they can certainly give you some workflow suggestions maybe even sit with if if you have time sit with a a help desk person for a morning listen to the calls and just hear what what they're hear what they're they're hearing from the users that'll give you some great ideas to add to your test suite and it'll get and it will also it'll also kind of get your system one thinking going get your 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 creative juices going and and all of those ways that 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 helps reduce biases you know if you sit with it, it you you, you have your bias there your you you think you know how people are thinking you think you know, you know, you, you, your blindside bias, you think you know exactly how your users are thinking, but you don't really. And your help desk people probably do know more. So kind of a summary here is, well, how do we find bugs? Well, I think we have to focus less. We have to use more intuition and we need to believe what we can't believe. And I want to thank you all very much. Now, I think you may have noticed some bugs throughout the presentation. Um, there were cute little spiders. I guess they're arachnids, but um, anybody have a guess as to how many there were? Feel free to throw that into the chat. And again, I'm Jerry Owen. I'm with Koala Test Group. Uh, we're the largest um, your play independent testing services company and i appreciate hearing your questions and, and ideas thanks so much thank you jerry oh was there a oh sorry is there a time delay on me there C can everyone hear me i can perfect um so there still is time to ask um jerry your questions um do have a guess if you were paying attention about how many bugs were in her presentation and put that there in the questions box on the right hand side of your screen um just a reminder um that we are going to our biggest conference next month in the hague so tickets are available over on our main site so that's the 12th of 15th of November and we will be in The Hague, the Netherlands. So we'll get on to questions. Right. Okay. Do you feel that every application of system one thinking in testing is wrong and we should aim to revise system one test to system two approaches? If so, how does this apply for areas like exploratory testing or usability testing, which rely more on tester experience? I, yeah, I, I don't think that we, well, I certainly think that, that, um, you know, when we pick up something, certain test cases, usability type test cases, I, I think when we, especially if we're testing the same application multiple times, I would certainly something that you pick up through exploratory testing or, or from users, I would certainly definitely add it to your your test set and put it more into your system too. Um, but and, and and that can be cumulative. But I think I think that's the, the nature of system one testing is there's always room for more. There's always room to learn more. And that's how we that's how we address our biases. So 
yeah, I would I would continue to keep using system one. And and when we find things that we can reuse, certainly put it into the test suite. Okay. Do you think we as testers only look for similar kind of errors in tests and nothing out of the ordinary by habit? Um, well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think some of it's habit. I think I think it's it's some a lot of it's habit, but a, a lot of it is it 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 comes from it comes from our biases. Yeah, it, it, a lot of it comes from the biases that we talked about. Um, it's a similar question here. It's just, um, do you, are we just looking to confirm our, our assumptions and tests? That's what the confirmation bias is about. Okay. And I think often we are, you know, we, well, we're proud and we, we're, we're proud of our, our, our test suites and we should be, you know, we, we spend a lot, we put a lot of time and effort into developing good test cases that we, that really thoroughly test the functionality of the application. And, and so, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the, that's the confirmation, that's the confirmation bias. We think, you know, we, we don't, we don't deliberately as much as what some people might want to think, we don't deliberately miss bugs. Mm. You know, I mean, we think when we've, when we have, when we have written our test cases, that is, that it is our belief that we've covered everything. Otherwise, if we thought there was more to cover, or if, you know, it, it, and, or if we can't cover everything, you know, with continuous testing and whatnot, it is our judgment, it is our judgment that we have covered the most important, the most risky code. So yeah, we've made these judgments and, and of course we're gonna stand by our judgment if we, if we feel our judgment is wrong, I hope we'll fix it. Um, and sometimes, you know, we may find, and that's the importance of the system two and the exploratory, the system one and the exploratory testing. That gives us our opportunity that maybe we have missed something and it gives us our opportunity to think, to fix it. But yes, absolutely, that's the confirmation bias. Mm. That's falling in love with our test cases. And of course we do that. Um, but the way we mitigate it is through the, is through exploratory testing. Okay. Can you elaborate on what you said with about Andrew Brown and estimating the time needed for a test cycle? Yeah, sure. At, um, Andrew just did a real, I saw a real interesting presentation at Star West. Actually, you know, I think um, Andrew spoke at uh, your star. Yes. Yeah. Uh, last year, I believe he's, I believe he's on the agenda again this year. He is. Yes. Um, yeah. He's, he's a great guy. He, yeah. he knows. And I would encourage you if you get to go to your star, definitely catch up with him and, and talk to him about biases because he's made a whole study of it. And actually, I think SQS um, is doing some some work in 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 training people to de-bias, um, which I think is really interesting. But um, so he did a presentation about kind of well it was kind of similar to this this i focused here on bias and how biases cause us to miss bugs he, his presentation focused on biases that cause us to uh, miss on our estimates and and he talked about anchoring um and you know because the business tells us well we need it as soon as possible so we've already psychologically shaved off some number of days just because we think they're not going to accept the longer estimate. Uh, he also he also talked about sunk cost. Um, the sunk cost bias is one where um, people, you know, especially it, it, it kind of, it, you've already put money into something, you've already put time, money, effort, whatever, into something and you keep going with it because you don't want to lose what you put in. Um, I, can, I can give you a real good example about that one. Uh, I, had, I was on a project that actually went three years. Um, the, the correct thing would have been, was to go with a different vendor. Um, but we had already put in several million dollars, US dollars into the project and 
I was talking to the, 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 the product owner. He says, you know, there's just not the appetite. We knew it was the right thing to do. The company had merged and the rest of the company was using the other vendor. It was absolutely the right thing to do, but they just, there was no appetite to eat that several million dollars. Um, so that, that sometimes happens in, in estimation. Um, and he went on with, with a couple of others, which I can't remember at the time, but you know, the big one I got out of it was, was the anchoring. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, our, we're, we're by, well, you know, the, the other thing is too, curse of knowledge fits in there. Um, we think, well, we know the application pretty well. We have, um, we have our regression suite that we're probably only going to have to add X number of cases to, well, it turns out need your regression suite really needs to all be rewritten and, and it's things like that, you know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, his presentation was very interesting and, and he came, it came up with a lot of reasons why we tend to, um, you know, make our estimates way too short. Yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of that, I, he, he won best paper uh, at our conference last year with why we make mistakes. So if anyone is interested, actually, that ebook is over. We've we've made that best paper into an ebook and that's over on our Huddle site. If you do want to follow up with um, with what Jerry said there and Andrew Brown. Um, so how often should we take these risks? Take risks as in I, I think I think it was just referring to um you know we as testers I suppose should should take risks and shouldn't be you know should be allowed to take risks. I think this question was kind of um We should do it all the time. All the time. Yeah. You know, I mean you, you know, it, it, there's the, the it, there's always gotta be room to to if 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 all you do is just execute the test cases that you planned, well, you know, that's where that's where you're going to miss bugs. I would encourage you to try to, to, to and, and to take risks in your thinking, too, you know, try different approaches. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would do it all the time. Okay. Because the more you do it, the more used to it, you, actually, the better you get at it, too. Absolutely, yeah. That's true. Um, are you using common test techniques like boundary values analysis, use case cases, decision tables, etc., or are you using intuition to find bugs? Well, all of uh, all of the test techniques. It's really both. I mean, all of those test techniques are part of your system two thinking, and you certainly should be. You certainly should be using those. Um, the thing you have to watch is 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 relying on them solely, because when you're relying on them, that's where your your inattentional blindness is going to come in. You make sure you execute all those, and that's great, but you have to look beyond, and that's where your system two thinking comes in. How much exploratory testing is enough? <sighs> You know, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, I think it really depends depends on the situation. Um, you know, if you're if it, it depends it depends on the on the submit the the um, what what's the consequences? You know, are you are you working on something? Are you working on a, a website that sells you know a retail website? How are you working on a medical device? You know, I think you need a lot more. Well, you, of course, you need a lot more rigor in in your 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 test plan, your your test techniques when you're dealing with something safety or 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 medical or you know critical safety critical uh, you know life threatening. You need a lot more rigor, but I think you need a lot more rigor there with your exploratory because those are the areas where you the bugs have the most consequence. Okay, and um, last question here. Um, uh, there was a couple of questions around the same thing. It was, you mentioned that SQS have training to do this de-bias, and is there exercises out there that, that we can do to um, train ourselves to de-bias, or is there courses available? Well, you know, to be honest, the first thing, the first one I, was what I just heard about from yeah. Dr. Brown, is that they're designing it. Um, it's interesting. Kahneman um, said that he he had found that there wasn't a whole lot you could do 
uh, about about biases. Um, but I think I think the biggest thing is awareness um, and 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 doing. OK, so I if you would look at your biases as risk, which it is, it's your biases are risks to missing test cases. I think if you you try some mis risk mitigation strategies, it's probably I, I think maybe the risk mitigation might be a little bit better than trying to de-bias. Um, and, and I and so, yeah, I, I would like to learn more about Dr. Brown's de-biasing and I'm going to plan to talk to him at your star. Um, but I, I as as of right now, I don't know of any like online courses or anything. OK. Um, thank you for your time today, Jerry. Um, there will be a recording of this webinar available up on the Huddle site. So share it with your colleagues, share it with your friends and um, keep the discussion going. Thank you again, Jerry, for being with us today. And I guess I'll see you next month. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Bye now. Thank you. Bye bye.